So, hi, Nigel. Uh, it's fantastic. I'm glad that we have a chance to chat. I know you're super busy uh, these days. Yeah, it's great to see you, Pavel. Yeah, thank you for getting me into this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I wonder if we could actually just start off with, um, well, I mean, maybe you want to introduce yourself a little bit. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got, as I mentioned at one point, I think we've got about 300 people participating in this climate marathon, which is super exciting. Great. And Great. I'm so glad that you're also on board and, and doing you know, your 42 kilometers plus each week. Yeah, yeah. And I just wonder if you might, you know, introduce sort of yourself, your background. Um, I think you've got one of the best titles in the entire world. Oh, yeah. I'm a high level. I'm one of two high level climate action champions. Right. Um, so, yeah, so so, well, mean? well, I mean, my, my background, I'm, um, uh, I'm from Scotland. I was born in Glasgow. So COP26, which we'll talk about, is going to be in Glasgow next year. So I'm looking forward to going back there. Um, and... Um, the, the 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 role of high level climate action champion was created in in Paris five years ago by the parties to the UN Climate Convention, recognizing that sovereign states alone cannot solve the problem, but they need everybody else. So the job of the high level climate action champions there's always two. So I work with Gonzalo Munoz, who's the Chilean champion appointed last year, and we'll work together this year. Then I'll work with a African champion in for cop 27 which will be in 2022 um and then i'll and then i'll drop off um the role was created to work with what the un system calls non-state actors of so businesses investors cities regions schools universities civil society basically everybody else um to drive ambition and action on climate change and then to use that to support countries to go faster so my job is to basically add a zero or take 10 years off everybody's um everybody's target i just said i just posted on linkedin that i, I, I felt a bit of karmic revenge from you because you've just upped my running target and now i've oh, you, i've just sort of been nigel by pavel um <laughs> so that's so that's the job and, and it's working with a big global coalition that we call the marrakesh partnership because th that was formed in cop 22 which was in morocco hence the name and that's uh, like hundreds of partners all around the world working with those different stakeholder groups um <laughs> to drive ambition and action. So that's, that's, that's the job. Okay, great. Yeah. I don't know how you find the time to, you know, to run 42 kilometers per week at the same time, but. Um. Lunch, lunch time. I'm just, this is lunch time. Yeah. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running every lunch pretty much at the moment. Yeah. I think a lot of people are finding really creative times, whether it's in yeah. the dark in the morning or, or after work or, or at lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just finding that doing it at lunchtime, it punctuates my day. So I'm not on zoom calls the whole time. Right and um without without extending the day so yeah. i'm not really an early riser because i'm the idea of running in the dark is a sort of romantic idea for others and then <laughs> by the end by then by the end of the day i'm exhausted right so then it's what, what's working for me is just doing it at lunchtime yeah absolutely and i'm wondering if, if sort of for yourself um you know going through this experience you know i, I know that you're a bit of a runner as well um uh, you know, but maybe this ups ups the mileage a little bit for you but I'm a, sp I'm a sporadic run. I'm as a, as a rugby player. So, or, or, you know, until I was 30. And then, so all my sport was team sports. So it's easy. You just sign up and then you turn up for every session and every match. So, yeah. but every now and again, I enter something like a century bike ride or a half marathon or something to force yeah. myself to train. So I have been starting to run again recently, but yeah, I've, you just doubled my mileage basically. Oh, well, you doubled your mileage. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I doubled my mileage. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, sort of thinking about the relationship of, you know, this virtual marathon, um, doing a marathon a week for a month, uh, and climate change and sort of ecology more broadly. You know, maybe can you think about sort of your own relationship to the, you know, more than human world through this activity? Well, first of all, it's not a virtual marathon. I'm actually <laughs> running. About you. What are you doing? Are you just just writing down mileage? It's real. Like my legs are telling me it's a it's yeah, a fair enough. All right, all right. Physical marathon. Um, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I've always been an outdoorsman. I mean, both a sportsman. But what what really got me into working on climate change was a love of wild places, particularly cold wild places. I spent time climbing and ski touring in Iceland, Greenland, Patagonia as a younger man. Yeah. Um, and actually was confronted with the reality of climate change in 1987. I was on a climbing expedition to East Greenland, mm -hmm. and we were supposed to be doing some research on, a, on one of the big glaciers that drains the ice cap on the East Sermilic Glacier. It goes into Sermilic Fjord. This is all before digital mapping, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so we had the map that had been physically surveyed many years before, and then we went to the where the snout of the glacier, the end of the glacier, was supposed to be, um, which is where we're going to be doing our research. And um, we we couldn't find it. So we we of course we thought that we'd just got our navigation wrong because when you're a young climber, you, one thing you know is that maps are the truth, right? Um, so it took us a long time to figure out that it wasn't us that was wrong. It was the glacier was wrong, and it it, it retreated twenty kilometres. Yeah. So and then you know then I was and I was a mathematician so I've always done work on non-linear non mechanics and then I, I did, did my master's in holistic science at Schumacher in like 15, 14 years ago so I this, this sort of connection with the physical world has always been in, in, important for me and then like I've just been out running that running in the rain is something that I love right it's from years of training in the rain on muddy rugby pitches to cycling over Dartmoor in the rain or running just here. I live really near Schumacher, so just running along the, the tractor side of press and up past the, just do a loop past the, the Great Hall. Yeah. I actually really, I actually really like running in the rain or something. Yeah. It's, it's just a, you know, physical experience of being in the world, right? It's very grounding. Yeah. yeah. You're really immersed in everything, aren't you? Yeah. 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 So I want to go back a little bit to, um, you know, talking about receding glaciers somewhat, um, yeah. because that was one of my inspirations as well, you know, through my own climate run project, you know, across Iceland and Svalbard and Northern Scandinavia, right? One of the most visible things, um, you know, is the glacial recession. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, there are no glaciers uh, in Scotland, right? Um, but thinking about, you know, what are, you know, are there any sort of apparent um, impacts of climate change, you know, in the UK at all uh, that we might be able to point to so people can, you know, because very often people might suggest, oh, well, you know, I don't see climate change here. It doesn't impact me immediately. It's not something tangible for me. Um, is there something well, I think anybody who's got a relationship with the natural world, whether they're a, a walker, a fisherman, a gar my mum's a mad gardener, she's 84 mm -hmm. years old, she's out in the garden every day. Um, even, you know, even you know, people who, who you know, swim outdoors, anything, anything like that. Farmers, I mean, my yeah. brother-in-law's a, a farmer. And it's like, it's, no, it's, just, it's like do, the question, do you believe in climate change is just a sort of right. kind of a stupid, it's just a stupid question. It's like, what do you mean believe? It's not a matter of faith. I've just lived, I've lived in my, so you see the changes. So, you know, the changes in, if I'm a bird watcher as well. We have little egrets all over the place. Now, 20 years ago, that you never saw a little egret, or if you did, it was it was very, very rare. Um, uh, you know, they got lost. Um, now, now, now they breed here; they're here all year round. So, you know, we, I think anyone who anyone who's who's got a relationship with the outdoors yep. has experienced, you know, changes in the seasons. Yep. High, you know, war, much warmer days. I mean, you can read the science, but you can also experience it. Of course, flooding is the other th big thing, right? You know, thousand year floods every 10 years. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I I know there are some people ideologically in some parts of the world who doubt it, but my experience is that, not, is that that does not include anyone who's got a physical relationship with the outside world. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's not so much a question of doubting it or, or not believing it, but it's being able to make the connections you know, sometimes between here's the impact of me driving my car to work every day, uh, and then well, the that, thing that happens. Yeah, and... well, that, that, that's much harder, right? Because there's a, there's, it's it's there's a sort of logical, either there's a logical disconnect between um, individual actions. I mean, it is it is it is a fact, right, that your actions are irrelevant, <laughs> in, in, just yeah. mathematically, right? Yeah. So that, that leads to either overwhelm, like people are like, what can I, I can't do anything that's significant or, or disengagement, like, like what's the point? Yep. Um, uh, so of course it's not the, tr it's not the, it's not, but it's both the fact, if you like mathematically in terms of the tons of emissions, but it's, but it's also that th th your actions are irrelevant, but it's also the fact that because you're connected to all sorts of people and if you take a stand and change your behavior maybe your partner or your family or your people in your running club or the people in your chess club or the people in your book club or people the people you work with or your students or your teachers will, will will change so you know like one of the things i often say is that the the probably the most powerful question um changing behavior right now is the question of a teenager whose mother or father is running a, a company which is very much part of the problem, whether it's a cement company or an oil and gas company, 
yeah. or an automotive company like what you know what did you do at work today mummy or daddy right you know right. to fix to fix this problem that's a tough question for a, a parent to, to answer right so I think this, one, this is one of the challenges we face is, right, is that the interconnectedness of everything means that every action matters, but the scale of the problem means that it's easy to feel totally disempowered and, and, no, and no agency. Yeah, exactly. Well, one, of the, one of the things I've been doing alongside this marathon is um, reading and posting little excerpts from The Future We Choose, um, right, yeah. which yeah. I think gets at exactly that question, really. Um, you know, and there, there are so many passages in that book that, that speak directly to, well, you know, your mind is telling you exactly that you know, my action isn't going to have much of an impact um, or, you know, I don't know what impact my action is going to have. Well, then just do it and try it and yeah. sort of multiply that. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden you have 300 people around the world doing a, a climate marathon and that begins to have an impact. Yeah. And maybe, I think and maybe we'll have 30,000 next year. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll have to do it again next year. Right. I, I, I think I'm on board for that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's only going to grow. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm thinking about, about COP26, and unfortunately we had to you know, postpone it from this year, um, and, you know, which gives you more time to plan for next year. Yeah. So it's the 26th one, right? I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. COP26. Yeah. So can you say a little bit about, well, why there have been 26 of them, um, and sort of why is this one particularly important, and what actually happens at yeah. these? So why have there been 26 of them? Because it's 26 years since the... Um, the, the United Nations Climate Convention was formed um, and because this is about the total transformation of society so it's complicated yeah. and and it needs everyone to move yeah. um, so um, and you know people don't like change right and there's all and, and so and the job's not done so we've got to keep doing we've got to keep going so what what happens I mean the, so formally it's it's um, the conference of the parties the parties are the legal parties to the climate convention so they're countries they're sovereign states like the united kingdoms uh, uh, france united states uh, mexico uh, bangladesh you know fiji interestingly all 190 plus parties have equal voice in wow. the sense that the unfccc unlike many multilateral processes requires unanimity so you effectively have single country veto. You could argue that's one of the reasons why progress has been so slow. Yeah. But it's also one thing which allows us to, 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 to everyone to move together. So, I mean, formally the COP is a meeting of those parties to move the business of the, the, the convention forward. Um, I like to say that there the, are the, the really three bits of business and then I'll say why, why this one's so important. There's really three things going on in this climate, um, in, the, in our collective response to the climate crisis. There's the multilateral process, so nation states negotiating stuff together. Actually, the, the big deal there was Paris, right? That was the big breakthrough. It established the, the common goal of, of net zero, some, some vagueness about when we get there, um, uh, and, and the responsibilities of parties and the process of countries submitting a plan, so-called nationally determined contribution, and then ratcheting it every five years. Mm. Um, so in... And it established the high level champions role and this and the importance of the work of the non state actors. So those are the three things, the multilateral negotiations, the national plans, and then what everyone else is doing. Yep. So in Glasgow, there is still some stuff to be negotiated, but it's 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 mainly the rule book, like some of the rules to finalize the Paris Agreement, like on um, carbon trading and on transparency. I mean, very detailed, like exactly what information the countries have to submit to the secretariat every year. Yep. Um, also, some um, stock taking of promises that were made um, about um, climate development funding, in particular, is, 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 is a really important one politically. So that's the business of the that's the sort of if you like the business of the COP. That's done by negotiators in negotiating rooms. They're working at it all the time. They're working at it now. It's very complicated because it's it's kind of re-engineering the geopolitics of energy, really. Right. So it's really it's a big deal. Um, and then the second thing is this, are these national plans. And, and this is the reason that this, this COP is so important because it's the, it's the five-year anniversary COP. So it's the first time we get to see whether Paris is working. Like, will countries come up with more ambitious plans? So that's why the, the UN Secretary General and the, uh, the, the UK Prime Minister and now the French Premier are hosting this event on the 12th of December. It's an ambition event. Hmm. Really cool to as many countries as possible to say, okay, come on. 
What are you doing? Yep. How, how ambitious are you? So, you know, we've, we've, the, the, posit, you know the, the real positive things are to say is that Paris was a well below two degrees with best efforts to get to 1.5 degrees uh, you know, agreement. In, in October 2018, the, 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 at the request of the, 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 the parties, the, the International Panel on Climate Change published a report on the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Basically says, you know, you don't want to go there. You know, every fraction of degree causes a massive amount of human suffering and economic damage. So since then, we, a lot of us have been working to really reorientate the North Star to being net zero by 2050 or, or you know, 1.5 degrees. Um, or, or as Gonzalo and I say, net zero as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's nothing magical about 2050. If we could do it tomorrow with a magic wand, we'd do it tomorrow, right? Um, um, and so we've had some encouraging signs. I mean, the UK has got a legal commitment to net zero 2050. The EU is about to make that a binding commitment. China's just said it's going to commit to net zero before 2060. They've got a track record of under promising and over delivering. So if, when they're saying before 2060, that kind of means 2050. So you got, you know, some, a lot will depend on the, on the US election. Uh, you know, the US will come out of the Paris Agreement on the 4th, the day after the election, because Trump's already signaled that three years ago. Um, if he wins, they'll stay out. If Biden wins, the first thing he'll do is come back in and that will change the politics a lot. Um, so that's the second thing is those national plans. That's why this, that's why, that's why this one's so important. And then the third thing is what all the businesses and investors and cities are doing. That's, that's what Gonzalo and I are working on. That's why we launched, a, a, to use the running metaphor, we launched the race to zero, just yeah. getting thousands of businesses and cities and investors and schools and universities to commit both because they need to take action, but also that sends a political signal to governments that they can and maybe should be bolder if they want to be elected. Right. Next time. Yeah. So one of my questions then was, um, you know, as sort of normal people, sort of regular individuals, you know, it seems like COP26 isn't necessarily some an event that we can participate in. Um, yeah. But, you know, are there things like Race to Zero that we can, you know, advocate, participate in, you know, go to our businesses, our legislators and say, we need to do this? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people do go to COP normally because there's a lot, there's a large civil society attendance from all stakeholders, from indigenous to youth to um, cities, businesses, um, a lot of NGOs. So there's a lot, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people would, will, would normally would go to Glasgow, of course, depends on COVID, whether that's still possible next year, but normally you'd expect 30 or 40,000 people wow. to and participate. And they're both there, but some of them are advising countries or they're, or they're trying to convince countries to, or they're, 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 they're very much keeping an eye on what's happening in the negotiations and writing up about them and trying and, and trying to mobilize people back at home to put pressure on their government. So there's quite a sophisticated process. Um, so some but that tends to be people who are working for organizations who, who are accredited and go so I, I think whatever happens next year it'll be a much more open cop i think it'll be a lot more virtual ability to dial in and find okay. out what's going on there um and we're doing a lot of this big partnership with ted and future stewards we just launched this countdown initiative um a couple of weeks ago so so um, and that included about 600 tedx events all around the world so there'll be i think there'll be like three or four thousand tedx events TEDx countdown events, which are climate specific events in October next year. That'll be an opportunity for an awful lot of people to get involved, to, to listen in or to, to speak about, to talk about the work they're doing. Yep. Um, we also just launched a big campaign called Count Us In to try and reach a billion global citizens who are not yet engaged. Um, and that's got about 70 partners and that's about the 16 actions that every individual can take. So, right. and, 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 and with all the different partners, we add, we add all that up so that, um, and and then, as you say, every everybody is a part of many circles, whether it's a family, a street, a business, a school, yep. um, you know, what they do with their pension, if they've got one, um, what they who they vote for. So there's lots of things that people can do. And as you mentioned the, the wonderful book, Future We Choose, from our good friends, Tom and Christiana. That, that, that's got some good examples. Count us in. You just, if you just Google, it's, it's count-us-in.org, you can find and just log in and make commitments. And that, that, that's the way of just adding, you know, adding your voice with, you know, we, we're aiming to get a billion people. Right. That's kind of a, yeah, maybe, we add, yeah. maybe we add too many zeros, but we might as well think big, right? Because we need, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have this, this role, high level champion, there's two of us, but we, we always say we need 8 billion champions, right? Yeah, yeah. Wait, start with one and then move yeah. forward. Yeah, 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 excellent, good. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I, hopefully I'll see you out there somewhere. Um, you know, well, perhaps... yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll see you on the, on the Zoom call on the, is it the 4th? Yeah, certainly. Uh, on Saturday. Saturday. It, Saturday. Saturday. At, at, I don't think it's the 4th. I think it's the... Oh, it's, it's at 4 p.m. It's the <laughs> 4th there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whenever it is. <laughs> Whenever we'll, it is. we'll put the right date in the link somewhere. Yeah. I'll see you there. Maybe, and maybe, and, and maybe see you when I'm, when I'm trudging, trudging around, getting my miles in around Dartington. Yeah. Absolutely. That sounds really good. Well, thanks right. so much, Nigel. All right. You're welcome, Pavel. Thanks. Great, great to speak to you and hopefully see you soon. All right. Yeah.